We're going to talk about software-defined storage. So let me take you on a little, a little uh, history tour. For, let, me, let me first I introduce myself. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on myself, but uh, my name's uh, Bamian Gobetz. I'm uh, currently uh, uh, responsible for uh, Hedvig's business in EMEA, so Europe, Mideast, and Africa. Um, I'm originally from, uh, from Santa Clara, California, Silicon Valley. I was at NetApp as a startup company. I was the one of the first few hundred people there. Uh, it was kind of fun, and they... Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I was uh, uh, you know, in California at NetApp in the, in the late 90s. I was probably the third tech support guy at NetApp doing global support there. Um, they ended up sending me to Europe um, to help start the business uh, for NetApp in, in, in Scandinavia and then Benelux. In 2005, I went to a small startup company that was doing cloud services um, called Data Basement, which, which, which grew pretty quickly doing NetApp hosting um, and, and uh, say, various services. Uh, they were taken over by Proact in 2011. And in 2011, I got a phone call from a, a friend of mine, Boaz Palgi, who is the CEO of Scale.io. May, maybe some of you have heard of Scale.io. Um, so I was, the I was number seven at Scale.io and did all the let's say for the first year and a half, two years, did most of the uh, like around 50 Scale.io deals. Um, one year into my employment there, we were aggressively taken over by EMC. So every time I try to work for a small company, you know, it either grows very large or get taken over. So I spent... <laughs> so coming from NetApp, uh, I was convinced that uh, I was going to meet Satan you know, when, I, when I got to EMC. It turned out that I actually really liked working at EMC and, and everybody was very nice. Uh, I just don't really enjoy working for big companies. So I, I um, you know, was kind of poking around, what am I going to do? And then I got a phone call from this guy, um, Avinash Lakshman, who I'll introduce in a second as this, the founder of the company. Um, and you know, I'll tell you, I'm like a, a sales guy now, so you know, I don't throw things at me. You know, um, but, um, we have enough throwing yeah. <laughs> so so I'm, a, I'm a sales guy now, and um, at, you know, at, the, uh, at, at the time, um, I was you know, kind of making this, this transition. I, I came across Hedvig Technology and, and spoke to Avinash, the, the founder. And, and like I said, I'm, a, I'm a, what I would call a lazy sales guy, right? So I just kind of want to sell the best product that's out there. You know, I have 20 years of, of you know, observing storage, and you know, I'd, I'd like to be at the place where I, where I feel like you know, we're going to have the biggest uh, 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 momentum and the best technology. So I decided to come to Hedvig, and I'm going to you know, walk you through uh, why I think software-defined storage, why the timing is, is pretty good to start thinking about that, and uh, you know, what specifically does Hedvig do. I'm not going to get too, too deep into technical details. I'd like to give you guys kind of the high-level story. So, so let me take you back to, um, you know, uh, say, some, some older days. Let, let's say that, you know, where are we at today and where are we going? And then this will help lead into you know, what we do. So if we go back to the traditional uh, infrastructure, I think traditional IT, uh, you know, we, we uh, saw a lot of physical servers. We would run, you know, a database on a server. We, we you know, these were all physically separated. We, we came to realize at a certain point when virtualization started to become popular that, you know, we have that one SQL database running on that server using 5% CPU, 5% memory, and I have a, 100 of those. And that didn't make sense, so let's consolidate those servers, you know, towards, uh, towards virtualization. And in the meanwhile, we have the, you know, the big vendors, the NetApp, EMC, IBM, HDS, you know, um, offering us a uh, selection of storage arrays, which you guys are all very familiar with. You know, we're going to access those through fiber channel or through IP, you know, SAN or NAS systems. Um, each each uh, uh, SAN or NAS appliance or, or box, um, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, um, is, is you know, speaking a certain protocol. So we tend to select storage by protocols, like I need a NAS or, you know, I need an NFS, I need an SMB, I need... You know, S3, Swift, I need iSCSI, I need Fiber Channel. We tend to, you know, isolate various types of workloads and applications by protocol, and vendors tend to build based on that protocol. So we end up with, in large companies, many different types of systems. You know, if you do business with EMC, you probably have a VNX, you probably have a, you know, an Isilon, you probably have, you know, various platforms which are simply really all the same hardware, kind of assembled in various ways to achieve different things, right? So... Where are we today, right? So where pretty much everyone here, if you run an IT center or you're working with IT, you're probably here, right? And, and here you're kind of, let's, let's you know, move into a next generation data center. We've now virtualized the operating systems. Um, virtualization gives us the benefit of resource sharing and, and a benefit of manageability and portability of those operating systems. We disconnect the you know, operating system from the physical hardware. 
However, we have not really taken a step in virtualization yet in most production environments. We're still using the same traditional um, storage arrays. Now, I'm not implying that that's a bad thing, right? So I don't sell those storage arrays, and I'm, but, but I also b understand and acknowledge that these are the mainstream. I think, though, that you know, what we're seeing is that they're, you know, if I, if I uh, um, you know, talk to a lot of customers, um, and, and you know prospects, etc. Um, I think most customers feel like the traditional technology is a little bit expensive. The support is a little bit expensive. Um, the acquisition, replacing it every three years, it's an ongoing cost, right? So that tends to be the main issue. And then we have other large sites which have kind of scalability issues, etc. So you know where are we going generally speaking? Well, if we vert if we go towards virtualized storage, right? And, and what's the benefit of virtualized storage? Well, it's kind of the same benefit as virtualizing your operating system environment. We get the benefit of sharing resources. You know, you know, we can we can uh, deliver IOPS and, and capacity in a very shared way. Um, and virtual storage kind of implies, and software defined kind of implies that um, we can start to use commodity resources like servers, right? So where before we're managing servers, networking, and storage, and all various types of specific hardware builds, um, software defined allows us to consolidate all of our physical resources onto commodity or name brand servers. So we eliminate the management and the complexity of all this dedicated storage hardware, and we just kind of manage a few more servers which have disks inside. So that's so you know think of it as a consolidation of, of resources, a sharing of resources, and then what we want to do, and this is what Hedvig is focused on, is we want to move away from um, uh, isolating products by protocol. We don't think that really makes sense. So if I look at if you look at this picture, you know we're going to use commodity or name brand servers um, to be able to build out uh, SAN or NAS or object uh, storage. Um, and we provide block file and object as a kind of layer, so your application simply can select which protocol do I want. Do I want iSCSI, NFS, uh, SMB, you know, S3, Swift, and then we can decide you know, how, where that data lands. Should it land on flash? Should it land on, on, on a hard drive? Should it cache or auto tier between those, right? So, so here you have, in theory, a kind of piece of software which can do uh, many different things. Now, you know, are there compromises? Um, you know, does it make sense to do this? Well, that, well, we believe so, right? And and but you know that that's certainly a discussion, right? Absolutely. So, what what is the point of you know what are we doing out here? So, if we look at big companies, you have a lot of different applications, right? We have private cloud, you know, that's a, a server virtualization. Those would typically be on a maybe a NetApp FAS or or EMC VNX. You have high performance apps running pure Flash. Uh, that might be, you know, I see my, my buddy's a, a tin tree back here. That might be, uh, you know, um, a pure stores. That might be an extreme I.O. from EMC. You know, the industry's leveraging the new media. And I think the winners there in terms of the Flash are the guys who are building around Flash instead of just putting Flash in old SAN arrays, which has a lot of bottlenecks. Backup and archive, it's going to be some kind of like data domain, VT, online VTL, uh, some form of tapes perhaps. Uh, and big data, so Cassandra, NoSQL, um, Dynamo, all the analytic type of things. Now, what we see in every big company is that they have different storage solutions for all these various applications, right? There are some exceptions to that, but it's very, very rare. So, you know, admins, if you talk to the guys, yeah, I have for, for my high performance stuff, I have this, and, and for my backup, I have that. Um, and ironically, it's all the same hardware. It's all the same disks, it's all the same memory chips, it's all the same CPUs. It's just a protocol difference. So, you know, understanding that all the hardware is the same out there, what is the real value of what storage vendors are delivering, right? I mean, if you look at a disk shelf, you look at a CPU memory, it's all kind of the same, right? There's all the interconnects are kind of the same. Um, you know, so, so, the, so we, we have this rapidly advancing technology. We have, you know, I think if you look at the, you know, the cheapness of RAM and CPU and SSD and flash and this stuff is coming down, we all know that that's, you know, we're all going there. Some vendors are leveraging that. Um, we're confronted with the laws of physics. You know, how can we extract that, that, um, th those IOPS and how can we uh, leverage the maximum performance and the maximum availability from the hardware that the industry is producing? Right? Nobody has magic hardware. We're all using the same stuff. So clearly software becomes the distinction. And you know, when I worked at NetApp too, this was our pitch as well, right? Hey, we, we, uh, you know, we do software, we have snapshots, replication. Um, that was a great story back then, and that kind of set the standard for, for you know, storage platforms today. If I look at a VNX, it's, you know, in my view, it's kind of trying to be a NetApp FAS. That's, that was kind of their uh, uh, goal, I think, at some point when NetApp kind of um, consolidated these protocols. Um, so all software vendors, their unique you know, uh, IP is their software. 
Um, and, we're, and we're no different, right? The only difference between an appliance and software defined really is that we build software that's distributed across you know, generic hardware and we step away from this um, need to run specific hardware and then, and then also go after those specific support models. So where are we evolving to, you know, at least from our perspective? So the traditional model is you know, what I would say hardware defined. It's, it's, it's software and hardware shipped as an appliance. Um, it's a scale-up model, so you typically have dual controllers running RAID, and you're adding disk shelves. Again, nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that's bad, right? I'm just, just making the comparison. Um, the uh, architecture is three layers, so you have server, networking, and storage. That's the, you know, the traditional thing. If we look at, at software-defined in terms of dist distributed solutions, there are you know, many out there. Um, you know, I would say that there's a characteristic of elasticity or scale-out. So instead of adding a bunch of disk shelves and very dense systems, uh, we add independent nodes for linear scalability. So smaller nodes um, you know, that are predictable in terms of, you know, as I expand, I get a certain uh, amount of IOPS, a certain latency, a certain capacity at a certain cost. It means I can start very small and, and scale out. Um, we have to move beyond RAID, right? RAID, we, we see the, the, the SAN vendors, the NAS vendors struggling to go from the two to four terabyte switch. None of them are gonna go to the 10 terabyte because they're still running RAID. Uh, RAID, just the rebuild times on, on a four, six, eight, or 10 terabyte drive is you know, kind of ridiculous. Uh, when I worked at NetApp in the late 90s, we had one gigabyte disks. And we didn't realize back then how big these disks were going to get. And RAID was OK rebuilding a one gigabyte disk. Right? But get to a four terabyte disk, it can take you 12 hours, 24 hours. And then all the vendors go to, well, yeah, now we have double parity. We have triple parity. You know, we're going to quadruple parity. Um, this is all overhead. It's just the model doesn't work for large drives. So, Modern vendors will move to you know, either replication of data uh, across multiple nodes or erasure code, which is something that obviously we do as well. Um, there's a new architecture out there. Um, I would say uh, the hyper-converged architecture, right? which, which we could say is forged by Nutanix and, and SimpliVity and these guys. They're very well known for that. Um, so, so you have kind of two architectures. We have the traditional architecture, and if we replace those traditional storage boxes with a, a scale-out node-based approach, then we call that hyperscale. So the only difference between traditional IT architecture and hyperscale is that we're using independent scale-out nodes to provide storage, distributed nodes, and when and hyper-converge just means that we're running the compute and the storage on the same layer, okay? Um, so, so uh, you know, we, we do both. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to over-pitch uh, our product, but, it, you know, it's important to be able to do both of those. And I would say, by the way, that you know, there's a whole discussion about what is software-defined. I would say, and I'm biased, but I would say software-defined means that the vendor sells you software and that you can implement that software on any hardware. Right? If, if, if you uh, ship an appliance, I would say you're not software-defined. Right? Um, NetApp was trying to convince me, you know, I have a lot of friends at NetApp, trying to convince me that they're software-defined because they make software. And I said, look, then you're kind of missing the point. Right? Yes, everybody makes software, but do you, can you sell me software that I can implement on commodity hardware and scale that out? Uh, no. Okay, so I, in my view, that's the difference, right? Because obviously everybody makes software. It's, it's how you sell it, how you package it, and then what the benefits are. Now, one interesting um, aspect is this idea of outsider innovation, right? So when you look at, at storage platforms, like from Moshe and I, who, who invented the, the, the Symmetrics, the VMAX, um, you look at, 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 at NetApp, you look at um, a lot of the big vendors, it's, they're coming from the industry. They tend to come from the industry, right? So they have incremental steps of innovation. Um, turns out, from our perspective, you know, and I'll talk about our founder in a second, our founder came, did not come from the storage world, right? He came from the uh, application and the user-oriented uh, world. Um, and I'm going to come back to that. But sometimes, you know, you need, you need an outsider to come in from a fresh view. Maybe this guy doesn't know what the limitations are of the current systems, and he starts to work around those things. So I'm going to explain, I'm going to, you know, talk a little bit about, about outsider innovation in terms of how our, you know, product was developed. So what, what is it all about, right? I think in IT, we like to think it's about IT. But it's not really about IT, right? A company wants to run an application. And so you get into a cycle of you know, building an application, you know, uh, uh, receiving input from that analysis, improving the application. So let's, let's look at some of the companies that are innovating out there, right? So, so we used to think in IT, maybe 10 years ago, that we were, you know, at in the enterprise, 
you know, running the coolest, biggest, baddest environments, and you know, who was going to do something different than that? So here comes uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix. They're confronted with real problems. They have to manage tens of thousands of servers, tens of exabytes of data, um, you know, on an ongoing basis. These guys are facing technical challenge, which is, have never been seen before in the industry. And it turns out you can't solve those problems, or they couldn't solve those problems with enterprise approach. So what they, what they do, you guys know Google, Amazon, Facebook, you know, racks and racks have commoditized x86, and they're running their you know, networking on there, they're running applications, they're running storage, they have you know, sometimes shared, sometimes dedicated nodes. You heard the stories about Google where they use you know, grocery shelves, and they have motherboards sitting on the grocery shelves, they have shopping carts where they're throwing away bad motherboards and swapping everything. It's, it's you know, going to be a, a highly commoditized environment, and this is the only way to get to this kind of scale. And so what's very interesting is now we're flipping the game, right? We in IT, in the enterprise, are looking at these guys, hey, how are these guys able to run at a tenth of the cost of us with you know, multiple times of performance and, some, and, some, you know, and disaster recovery? You know, this, this is a new model being driven from the consumer market, and I think that we're going to continue to see that. The amount of data being created by consumers is now starting to out way the data you know, being managed by enterprises. In the enterprise, if we talk about you know, one, two, three, four, five, ten petabytes, you're a pretty big enterprise. Um, these guys are talking about exabytes, so multiple you know, tens and hundreds times uh, of, that, of that amount of data. So, so where are we going with this? So we're going from siloed to multi-tenant, we're going to standardization, shared infrastructure, in some cases around private cloud use, um, automation or self-service, for sure, there's a huge movement in the world from scale up to scale out. That's what you see in all the, a lot of the modern storage platforms are, are going towards scale out. It just makes more sense. Whereas before, the whole idea was to have redundant and highly available hardware and have ways of managing that hardware. Um, we now have moved to an environment where we um, expect things to fail. Right? So if I have 20 nodes, I expect a node to be rebooted. I expect two nodes to fail. I expect a network to go out. So we're building now around this, this, these failures. Right? You guys. Um, understand that if we rely on hardware, let's say we buy a server because it's very highly available, that's not the way we, we can create availability. We have to assume that all this stuff will fail. And that's going to be the, the six, you know, how do you become successful in this space? That's one of the really important aspects. So you guys know what your data centers look like. You've seen enterprise data centers, a lot of name brands, a lot of logos, big racks with specialized things. Sometimes your vendor want, has to be his rack. You know, very disparate looking in environment. Uh, when you go into a Yahoo or a Google or an Amazon, it looks something like this. It's just a bunch of x86 stuff. Five minutes? Okay. So, so this, we think, is where it's headed in terms of large data sets and large uh, storage uh, deployments. So I want to just quickly introduce Avinash so, so you understand where we're coming from. So Avinash, um, he was um, recruited by Amazon. He's a, a, a very, very smart um, hyperscale engineer. In fact, in Silicon Valley, he's very famous, actually. In Silicon Valley, you have kind of technology guys who are famous, a little bit like movie stars are famous in Hollywood. If you're from Northern California, you know, and you're at a bar, and you say, hey, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's that guy, Avinash. He's the guy who did Google, right? He's the guy who, you know, it's kind of it's cool if you've, if you've seen the... If you know anything about Silicon Valley. Anyway, so he's a really well-known guy. He was recruited by, by Amazon in 2004. Amazon was blowing up. They needed a, a solution uh, for how to scale their, their data sets globally. And so they hired Avinash and, and one other guy to sit down and write Dynamo, which was backing their shopping experience and also the hosting environment that they were scaling out. Um, the Dynamo morphed into what we know today as a NoSQL movement. So Avinash is considered the father of NoSQL, one of the fathers of the kind of whole movement around NoSQL and, and, and a lot of these analytics. Uh, systems and, and big data systems. Uh, he did a great job there. I think we can say that Amazon is pretty successful. They're not profitable, but I think that's a, a different discussion. I mean, in terms of what they've accomplished, uh, they are the biggest hosting provider uh, in the world, um, trying to gain market share, I guess. Anyway, in 2007, he got a phone call from Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. So um, Mark had heard about Avinash and what he had accomplished at Amazon and said, look, we're um, growing very quickly here at Facebook. We have to scale into exabytes of data and, and millions and billions of transactions. So he hired Avinash um, to build out the infrastructure behind Facebook. Avinash sat down, single-handedly wrote the Cassandra database, uh, if you guys have heard of Cassandra. Um, he then released it as open source and hired a team to work on that within Facebook. Facebook doesn't uh, care about their IT technology, so they just open source everything. They only care about their IP, which is the social aspect of that. 
So Avinash gained a, a very big reputation and a lot of experience building hyperscale systems. Everything he does is like, how do we scale, right? He doesn't come from the world of, yeah, we have a one petabyte system, we need to go to two petabytes. You know, how do we go, how do we build an exabyte system that's in 50 data centers globally, you know, uh, with, with doing 100 trillion transactions, I don't know how many, 100 billion or whatever it is, crazy amount of transactions per day. So what we do is we take commodity or name brand servers, we, put, we combine that with software and we end up with a storage platform that mimics uh, every other storage platform today. Um, before we, we went to market, um, he wanted to have all the bases covered. So we want to have a no compromise solution. So scaling out uh, any, any hardware, any operating system, any hypervisor, any architecture, um, N plus one scale out. Um, be able to provision and manage everything through REST, that's very important. And then of course managing high performance, um, you know, all, the, all the buzzwords. In other words, all the features you would expect in a high-end uh, enterprise array we have in a software-defined platform. So we think that there's a, what I would say, a no compromise uh, option here, where you can make a, tradi a transition to consolidated software-defined without compromising the features and the disaster recovery and the efficiency components that, that, you, that you would normally have. So our vision is consolidating all of these applications on you know, uh, back-end servers that have various uh, uh, types of hard drive, uh, flash arrays, uh, or say flash drives, SSDs, um, from a single GUI, from a single point, we can create a virtual disk which manages all your protocols, block file and object, um, any disaster recovery policy up to four data centers, synchronous, asynchronous, compression, dedupe, uh, clustered file system. Uh, you can isolate where your data lives, auto-tiered, cached, you know, hard drive, whatever. So um, any number of copies, we went one and six, erasure code, all these things are consolidated into a single, single kernel, a little bit like what NetApp did, but then you know, in this new architecture and with more protocols.